Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to episode 184 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco, and today we're speaking with none other than Doug Ritter. You know Doug from his legendary uh, knives, the uh, Griptilian, the Ritter Griptilian, and then uh, now reborn as a Hogue knife. And uh, well, it's been through a, a, a series of great evolutions. That's the RSK Mark I. You know Doug Ritter for that, but you also know him because uh, he's been fighting for our rights, our knife rights for uh, over 10 years now and changing laws state by state. And uh, we do owe him a grit of gratitude. <laughs> A debt of gratitude if you are carrying uh, a knife in your pocket today and walking around as a free person with a knife in your pocket. Uh, quite likely you have Doug to uh, to thank. So I'm going to bring him on in a minute. We've had him on the show a couple of other times. We like to bring him back to get uh, an update on what's going on in the uh, knife laws throughout the states. And uh, well, before we get to that, let me just urge you to go to knifewrites.org. Check out what they're all about. Uh, they have a great annual uh, fundraising campaign uh, called The Ultimate Steal, and you stand to win any number of great knives just from donating uh, and keeping the cause going. So uh, I urge you to go over to uh, knifewrites.org and check, check out what they're all about. Um, so without further delay, I bring you Doug Ritter. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Doug, welcome back to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Hey, Bob. Hey, it's, it's always a pleasure. It's a it's great to see you. Great to have you back. It's great to actually see you on the show instead of just talking to you uh, over a phone line. Um, so uh, I gave you a little bit of a setup there, um, but for people who maybe haven't uh, listened to the didn't listen to the very first podcast, uh, give us a, a history of how you got into knives in the first place. Uh, uh, you, you came onto my radar first for your folding knives and for your survival knives, and then I've learned so much more since then. So tell us how you got into this. Well, I mean, like a lot of the folks listening here, I always carried a knife. I mean, since I was a child, back when you could carry knives to school. Uh, and, uh, you know, later in life, I got involved in uh, as, as a journalist in aviation and survival, aviation and marine survival. Um, obviously, a knife is a key survival tool. I started uh, equipped to survive on the web back before anyone really knew what the internet was. Um, it was. It is still sort of a consumer reports for survival gear. And, you know, at, at, at a certain point, I got tired of telling people that, um, this is the knife you should get, but, and there was always a but at the end of it. And um, uh, I and uh, Les Deasis, uh, the founder of Benchmade, had been friends for a long time. Uh, and we got to talking and uh, eventually out of all that came uh, what's known as the Ritter Grip or the original RSK Mark I. Uh, and then the mini RSK Mark I and then other knives from there. Uh, and then uh, in 2016, uh, Benchmade and I uh, split and uh, I went with Hogue and we have the RSK Mark I Generation 2, G2, the Mini G2 and, uh, and a new knife, which we can discuss uh, here pretty shortly. Oh, oh um, yeah. <laughs> that uh, we just introduced last week our fixed blade, our RSK Mark III G2. Okay, we are, we are most definitely gonna get to that and also variations on this amazing knife. Uh, this was my EDC today, you know, in preparation for our conversation. I have a little uh, different clip on there, but 
Uh, what a spectacular knife this is, I'll tell you. Thank you. Oh, and, you're... you know, we, we designed it so that if you don't like our clip, you can put a custom clip or a oh, Benchmade yeah. clip or an Emerson clip. Uh, it's a standard three-hole clip. We didn't want anything proprietary. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, uh, I do, you know, people like to make their knives their own. And that's one of the things I I frequently will do, especially when I see that common three-hole pattern that'll fit the uh, the Benchmades and the Emersons and such. Uh, but you, you said, I just want to back up a little. You said you were getting tired of telling people, this is the knife you should get, but. What were the common buts that you would mention when you would uh, recommend a knife? Well, um, it was too expensive or the steel was just so-so, um, or didn't love the blade shape. It was certainly adequate. So there was always this but. Um, and, you know, when I started with the RSK Mark I, uh, we had a tremendous difficulty convincing anyone that uh, you could sell a premium steel in an inexpensive handle. And the Griptilian uh, was a inexpensive plastic handle knife. And, you know, Benchmade basically said, Les said, look, if you want to do it, we'll sell them to you, but I don't think they're going to sell. <laughs> and, you know, we were the first one to take at the time uh, CPMS 30V, a V premium steel at the time and put it in an affordable handle so that you could buy a knife with premium steel and a solid handle and the great access lock um, for 125 bucks. I mean, that was unheard of back then. And now, of course, you see high-end steels and inexpensive knives, uh, inexpensive handles all the time. But we were the first. I mean, we started a trend. Uh, so with the blade, how did you... I, I know that you wanted to optimize uh, the cutting. You wanted to change. You wanted to make a blade that was optimal for all sorts of survival tasks. So how did you, uh, what, what went into designing the blade and what did you come up with? Well, so I had been a, a, a fan of Chris Reeves Sabenza for a long time. Uh, in fact, that was the first high-end knife I ever got. Uh, I literally saved up lunch money uh, <laughs> until I could afford it. And so I loved the blade shape, uh, the drop point blade shape. Uh, I wanted it to be a little bit um, uh, uh, more robust. You know, Chris uses a hollow grind. Uh, I went with a flat grind, a very high flat grind, which gave us really good geometry, a fair, fairly thin but still robust uh, behind the edge. And it's proven to be very successful. People love it. Um, it still has excellent sliceability, but it's also a robust, solid blade that'll stand up to the kind of abuse that, you know, you can find yourself in. Uh, not too many of them actually get used in survival situations, but they've gone to war in the Middle East. They've gone, been used by EMTs to cut people out of cars. I mean, it's a, it's a knife that will... It's a knife you can bet your life on. Yeah, no doubt. And and I have to say, um, <clears throat> without really uh, revealing any any personal preferences, uh, I love uh, the Hogue version. The handle is um, a different, just a different experience than the Benchmade handle. Um, tell me a yeah. little bit about one, what went into making this. I mean, if you look at it, uh, here's a clue. It's contoured. It's it's very comfortable. Tell us. There, so. there is a, a huge amount of 3D machining that goes into the handles for these knives. Um, and to create that sunburst and checkered pattern. Um, and it took a while to get it just right so that it was aggressive enough to really give you a solid grip uh, besides the ergos of the handle, uh, which we improved upon uh, significantly, I think, from the original. Um, the, the, the idea was it should be beautiful and it should be functional at the same time. Um, it certainly would be less expensive to put a simpler design on the handle. That is a lot of machining that goes into each one of them. Uh, but people love it uh, and it's become a signature 
of all my knives. It is a very beautiful pattern and it feels great in the hand. I mean, it is very grippy in all dimensions. It kind of does what the um, what the FRN pattern on the Spydercos purport to do, which is grab you from every single direction coming and going. Good, that's the idea. <laughs> Apparently it worked. So then, uh, then you came out with a mini. What, yep. uh, what was the drive for that? Well, uh, we originally had the full size and then we introduced the minis. The minis, uh, the smaller knives have become, here we have one here. Okay. Uh, the smaller knives have become very popular. Um, this is the purple G Mascus that we just introduced um, in September. Put that right uh, up to your camera, if you would. There we go. Look at that. That's beautiful. I love that uh, color. So, and, you know, the, the, the relative size, there we go. You know, you've got a 3.4-inch blade on the full size, a 2.9-inch blade on the, on the Mini. Um, and one of the things we did was we made the Mini just a little longer. Um, and in doing that, we gave it really, it didn't make it any bigger in your pocket to speak of, but it gave a much better grip. And that everyone has raved about that. And I've been very thrilled that it's worked out that way. So you're saying you extended the handle on the mini, not, not the blade. A just little, the... Not the blade, just the handle. And we did, we also extended the handle on the full size compared with the original handle in order to give it a, um, uh, a lanyard hole at the back of the blade as opposed uh, to the top, like right. the original uh, Griptilian handle had. You know, that's just one of those things, always bugged me. We had the opportunity to basically start from scratch and just tick off the check boxes of what we wanted to improve, where we wanted to improve it. And, you know, Hogue has been incredible to work with. Their quality control is second to none. Uh, nobody, uh, Nobody provides a sharper knife out of the box than Hogue. Their their sharpening people are just wizards, and we have. I've just been thrilled with the the quality that we're getting out of them, and the consistency, and the responsiveness. Uh, I, I I'm not done talking about the handle quite yet, and and one thing <laughs> I want to say is, I I really appreciate. I am a sometimes lanyard guy. And I do appreciate the lanyard hole at the end because when it's kind of uh, up towards the top back here, if you're really gripping down on it, you're going to feel it. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a hot spot, if you will. But even more so, the extension of the handle makes it feel like it's really in there. And I would imagine on the uh, mini, it's even more apparent. I have a, just a, a run of the mill, um, Benchmade mini griptilian that always feels like it's slipping out of my hand. It just always kind of feels like it just needs a little bit more. Plus, the tail end is tapered. Beautiful design and a great design. I'm not knocking it, but uh, I would imagine on the R mini RSK Mark One having a little bit of extra handle there, plus the change in the handle shape at the butt, uh, it, it would make all the difference for making it feel like you have a solid grip on that small knife. Sounds like we need to get you a mini. Uh, I think so. <laughs> I, jeez, I, I, I cannot disagree. So, so you, um, you moved on to you were talking about Hogue now, and and uh, I have had, um, well, Hogue products since before they made knives. You know, their gun grips, and uh, they're they've been making knives for now. I think twelve years. Uh, mm -hmm. In twenty twenty one, they've been making about twelve years, all in house. They're incredible knives. I've had a few. Um, the one that uh, the one that I will never get rid of is this RSK one. I love this knife, and um, I think that they are doing some things better than you know. I think that this Able Lock is outstanding. It stands for uh, Ambidextrous Bar Lock Enhanced, uh, and it's the best of the bar locks I've experienced so far. I, I love hearing that. You know, we worked really hard uh, with Jim Bruins at Hogue and Scott Bruins to get that all right. Uh, it's got uh, Wolf Springs. Uh, you may know them from their gun springs. They're world famous for the quality of their springs. Um, there's a few other proprietary changes that we think help make it run 
much smoother than most of the other similar locks. You know, when that when when the patent was up in 2016, uh, everybody jumped on the axis lock design because it's just so intuitively perfect. Yeah. And you know, there was no reason not to use it, but there were plenty of reasons to make it better. Mm -hmm. And I think the Able Lock is just a better iteration of a genius design by McHenry and Williams. Uh, you mentioned the springs uh, in particular. Why? Well, uh, if the idea is to do something better, and you can, and and the springs are essential for the Axis Lock to work, why not use the best springs you can get? Uh, from my perspective, that's just a simple choice. The fact of the matter is that uh, Hogue has been using Wolf Springs in their automatics since day one. Um, you know, they come from a firearms background. So, uh, okay, we're going to put a spring in a knife. It's going to be a Wolf Spring. And right. so it was just natural for us to go to Wolf for the Omega Springs for the Able Lock. So, I, I mean, I was fishing when I asked you that question. Uh, the the uh, the Omega Springs have been a bone of contention for a lot of people. Um, I have never personally uh, used uh, an Axis Lock style knife enough to to uh, to make the Omega Springs uh, uh, crap out on me. Excuse the the French, but uh, I do understand a lot of people have had that problem. So it was addressed by simply going to a different manufacturer. Well, we think so. Um, look, I, I've carried access lock knives for, you know, well over a decade since they were first introduced. In fact, somewhere in my drawer is one of the prototypes of the first of the 710s with the access lock. Um, I love the access lock. You know, there, there were problems. I personally, like you, never experienced a failure, but I know people who did. Right. And if we were going to build a better knife, which was the idea, we needed to address that, and I think we have by using the best spring maker in America, if not the world. So you you come out with the RSK Mark One, you come out with the Mini, and and now there are variations. There's the probably my favorite looking one is the uh, flat dark earth with the with the black blade. You have that beautiful. Oh yeah, I mean that's just that's handsome. You know that's a classic combination. There it's you like, go. Uh, and then you have the orange handled one and you have the G-Mascus, uh, that purple G-Mascus you were just holding up. Uh, and now, let's see that. Now, does the G-Mascus come in both uh, sizes? Nope, so just far the, only the Mini. The Mini. Okay. The Minis have been incredibly popular. I mean, in proportion to the, the number of Minis versus full size that we used to sell, um, much higher proportion of minis now compared with the full size. Full size still exceeds the minis total, mm -hmm. but the minis are catching up. People are liking smaller knives, it seems. People really like that um, three to three and a quarter inch uh, for everyday carry, I guess, it seems. Um, but now uh, you just mentioned a fixed bladed version of this. Tell me about the, uh, tell you, oh, look at that. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that is cool. So this is the second generation version of my RSK Mark III. Um, four and a half inch blade. Uh, you can see the, the similarity in the handle design to the, uh, to the uh, folder. Um, it is S45VN. Uh, the latest and greatest. Uh, I'm really impressed with the toughness and and the edge uh, holding of of this steel. Um, Is the toughness why you chose that steel for a fixed blade? Yes. Okay. I think it's the perfect fixed blade steel at this point. Uh, if you're not going to, you know, for a larger fixed blade, maybe you go to M3 or you go to uh, one of the the other uh non stainless little tougher uh, if i was building a six inch blade or an eight inch blade but for this size knife i think uh s45 vn is just perfect and our experience using it has been 
spectacular. Uh, will you please hold that knife back up? I'm not done with it yet. <laughs> I want to, uh, so, and, and then we'll talk about the sheath. If I forget, remind me to talk about the sheaths because sheaths are so important and people kind of uh, forget about that. But you look at this blade and it is the logical extension of the, of the three and a half uh, Mark one folder. You've got that uh, a really broad drop point, uh, but the point is still center line to the handle. And uh, you've got a really high um, flat grind. It, it looks like it's very slicey at, at the same time as being very, very robust. Can we see the spine of it, please? Sure. So, so one of the things we did when we first designed the Mark III and, and continued with this one is while the blade is thicker, the geometry is almost identical mm. so that we were able to maintain the sliciness, if you will, um, with a more robust, thicker blade. Um, because you broadened it, uh, all the dimensions kind of followed exactly. and, you were, and you were able to, to get the same angles. In it. Yeah. Um, so it's still a very slicey knife, but it's just a little bit more robust. So let me see. Okay, uh, if you would hold it up close to the camera, I, I uh, there's a detail that I really like that plunge grind. The way the plunge grind extends, kind of down the uh, down that little uh, finger guard there, and uh, I like that. There's a little sharpening notch, which will which all the sharpening choil. geeks will yeah. love. A little a little choil there. Um, the shape of it, the whole thing. Uh, this looks like a great. Now, what do you what do you see this uh, main purpose for? How do you see people using this knife? Well, I, it's a perfect knife to take hunting or camping, hiking. You know, pretty much whatever you need a medium sized fixed blade for. And it's got a four and a half inch blade. Um, that is, to me, sort of the perfect companion to a small folder. Um, you know, you, you get bigger than that and you start getting into more of the sharpened pry bar style of knife. Right, uh, which right. This decidedly is not. Uh, we, we, we've done that and may do it again, but uh, this is not that. Yeah, this this seems like it would go great in your um, in your aviation survival packs that you sell. <laughs> um, and it has. And oh, it will well, continue there you, to. There yeah. you go. This, this, you know, the original of this blade was the standard knife in my Ultimate Aviator survival bat. And that's a thing that's still available if anyone is an aviator. Uh, right? Hopefully soon. Again, okay. um, we're working on getting the packs manufactured the because they were custom. So it's a process. Everything's harder uh, with COVID. Yeah, yeah. So how how has that uh you know that's a perfect segue to start talking about the laws here. How how has that affected um well first of all tell us about knife rights. Tell us how you got started in this fight. Um and and I mean cuz really you took it on almost single-handedly. I know you've had some help but um how did you get this how did this mission present itself to you and uh you picked it up and started walking with it. How did that happen? Well, originally back in, uh, it, it was the result of a really bad article in the Wall Street Journal that was uh, all about evil tactical knives. And as it turns out, it was written by someone who wrote a lot of bad articles about uh, so-called assault rifles. Um, he has issues with weapons, apparently. Um, and I realized that there was no NRA, there was no Second Amendment Foundation for knife owners. You know, there was a manufacturer's organization that didn't do a whole lot. Uh, but there was no one aggressively trying to get rid of some of these t terrible, irrational, and archaic knife laws that we had on the books that were left over from after the Civil War and from the 1950s. And it just, I just decided to do it. And everyone told me I was crazy and everyone said, you will never get a switchblade ban repealed. Um, and they were wrong. 
And, you know, 33 bills in 23 states later, I think we've proved that you can get these bad knife laws uh, gone if you work hard enough at it. So what do politicians have, what, what benefit do they, what perceived benefit do politicians have in uh, rebuffing your, your advances, if you will? I mean, you're coming to a state with a bill. So, so there are a couple issues when we bring a bill into a state. First of all, uh, knife law reform is rarely on the top of anybody's right. agenda. I mean, it just isn't. You just have to accept that. Um, we are unique in our field in that uh, we get support from both sides of the aisle, which is has always been unusual. It's getting to be even more unusual. Uh, we have Democratic sponsors. We have Republican sponsors. Almost every bill we've passed has passed with significant bipartisan support. Um, for different reasons, um, but we are essentially a civil rights criminal justice reform organization, and that is popular on both sides of the aisle. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't uh, folks who don't like what we're trying to do and who get in the way of it, uh, Governor Cuomo in New York being a perfect example, um, but the fact of the matter is, if we we persevere, um, we're uh, we're stubborn, and we keep coming back. And sometimes it takes two or three or four or five or six years to get it done. In New York, it took nine years. Um, but uh, one of our secrets of success is we just don't give up. Persistence. So, what's the difference between knives and guns? You said you have. Uh, almost, almost every state you have bipartisan support for these things. So what is different in the minds of, um, uh, of the people, um, uh, you know, they're you not guns. Okay. It's, it's that simple. Um, you know, it's criminal justice reform for both sides. Um, certainly on, on the, the conservative side, there are freedom issues and that sort of stuff. Um, on the other side, it's criminal justice reform. And let's not forget that the vast majority of knife bans that we have in this country uh, have racist uh, beginnings, whether it was bans on buoys and big knives and daggers after the Civil War to keep knives like that out of the hands of blacks, or whether it was the uh, racist themes that ran through the movies and Hollywood with switchblades in the 1950s. Um, so when you go and talk to, when I or our lobbyist, Todd Rathner, goes and talks to these politicians, they have a story to tell that they can relate to. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we know from our experience in New York City, where 85% of the people that were arrested on Gravity Knife uh, violations were persons of color. We know that it's their constituents that are most often targeted with these asinine knife laws. And so as a criminal justice reform argument, uh, it resonates with them much more so. And it's not guns. I mean, we have NRA F-rated legislators who sponsor some of our bills. Because it's not guns, right? Right. I, I guess in my mind, I was thinking uh, people who who shrink away from guns shrink away anything from anything that could be perceived as a weapon. But but and, and some of them do. I yeah. mean, you know, we we <laughs> I I remember in Tennessee a legislator getting up and and making a big deal out of the fact that you know we were going to have the apocalypse because people were going to be running around with swords yeah. and knives and um. The bill passed and it passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. And the fact of the matter is, you know, we've been doing this now since 2010. No legislature has tried to reverse hmm. uh, our knife reforms. Uh, there's never been a spike in crimes uh, committed with knives as a result of any of our bills passing. So it was very hard because we had no track record when we first started out. 
But now we have a track record. And when people ask questions like that, um, we have answers for uh, uh, Ohio being a classic example. You know, the governor just signed our bill on January 11th that was passed last year, six years in the making, uh, two years for this particular bill in Ohio. But the kinds of questions we get from the governor's staff, uh, we have answers for. No, there's been no increase in crimes committed with knives anywhere that we've done this. Uh, no, people aren't running around stabbing folks. Uh, yes, you can still prosecute someone who uses a knife illegally to commit a crime. Mm-hmm. Not, none of that changes, but we stop the arrest of people for carrying a simple tool. And that's what we're all about. Uh, well, in reading um, the Ohio bill or your article on the Ohio bill, and then uh, that's the state I grew up in and uh, where my folks live. And uh, and now contrasting that with the state I live in currently, which is Virginia, they almost they almost <laughs> seem on total polar opposites. Can you tell me uh, what what the o- Ohio knife law allowed and what what happened in Virginia last year? So. Uh, Ohio, so automatic knives and gravity knives and such have been legal in Ohio uh, for a long time to possess, but it has been illegal to sell them in Ohio. It has been illegal to manufacture them in Ohio. So, for example, Rick Hinder was unable to manufacture knives uh, in Ohio, switchblades in Ohio, automatic knives in Ohio. Um, And the other problem was their concealed carry laws were very vague and the concealed carry of almost any knife could potentially be considered the carry of a concealed carry of a deadly weapon. And so we fixed that and we fixed it very straightforward. Basically, it says a knife is not a deadly weapon unless it's used as a deadly weapon. Um, So even if you're carrying a knife, and you're stopped for, you know, a traffic ticket, um, the knife, the fact that you've had the, the knife on you when you committed a violation, which could have caused a problem before, isn't a problem anymore because you didn't use the knife to, to commit the crime, whether it's a serious viola- you know, misdemeanor or felony or it's just a traffic ticket. So essentially, uh, with the exception of preemption, we're almost done with Ohio, and hopefully we will work on preemption next. That's the plan. So in stark contrast, last year in Virginia, tell, tell me what happened there, here. I so uh, Virginia has uh, a absolute ban on automatic knives. Uh, you can't possess them. You can't manufacture. You, it's 100% absolute. Uh, We have previously tried to get rid of that, and it was vetoed by the governor uh, two years ago and two years prior to that. So we thought, um, how about, um, because there are a number of knife distributors in Virginia, how about if you can produce them, you can sell them outside the state? Uh, which would have added jobs to uh, Blue Ridge Knives workforce uh, and brought these jobs to literally the poorest county in Virginia. And it would not have had any impact whatsoever on Virginians because they still wouldn't have been able to possess these knives unless they were selling them out of state uh, or making them for sale out of state. And the governor uh, rejected the advice of his staff and vetoed the bill because if Virginians shouldn't have automatic knives, then Virginians shouldn't sell automatic knives to anyone else in the other 44 states where they're perfectly legal to own to one degree or another. Um, Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. Except he was in political hot water at the time, and he didn't want to uh, make anything that that may have had any optics uh, that may have gone against him. Even though his staff—that's interesting. Even though his staff recommended, uh, yeah, it's appalling to me, and uh, you know, it's very cowardly to me. But um, you know, that was that was a political decision on his part, having nothing to do but with it, your hard work or the logic behind no, your argument. It, it, you know, it cost the state 
jobs in the poorest county in the state. It, it, it was insane. But he is no friend of freedom, period. Yeah, and that, that's not the only example, but we'll stop right there with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where are the real trouble spots in the United States? If you're, if you're a knife lover and you find yourself living here, where are you really, where, where is your fight the most uphill? Well, certainly, um, I'd have to say the worst state in the country is New Jersey, uh, if only because it has very st strict restrictions on knives, and they are all felony. Okay. So if you violate New Jersey's knife laws, you are committing a felony automatic. That is the only state in the nation where knife violations are a felony. Um, and, you know, there are other states where it's difficult, uh, Massachusetts, uh, New Mexico, um, that's, we, we, unexpected. you know, Cal California isn't nearly as bad as some people think, um, and certainly better than New Jersey or New York in many respects. Uh, you can carry a gravity knife now in New York, but you can't carry an automatic unless you're fishing or hunting. Uh, and you, because <laughs> <laughs> that's when it's the most handy, clearly. Uh, if you're looking for rationality and knife laws, <laughs> you are not going to find that anywhere. Um, they are irrational. They, you know, they are historically irrational. They are anachronisms. They're and, hysterically in uh, are uh, They seem to be, uh, legis it seems to be legislation of emotion uh, frequently. Like knives freak me out. They should freak you out too. So, um, well, that's, we have a lot of that in politics. Um, and again, you have to go back to where these knives, where, where these laws first came from. You know, the, the, the first round of knife restrictions came after the Civil War. They made sure that blacks couldn't own guns. So blacks started carrying big knives, you know, what we would call a buoy knife uh, or carrying daggers. And so they came up with restrictions on that. Um, and then we have the 50s when Hollywood just scared the crap out of folks. With the that whole juvenile evil, delinquent thing. And, yeah, with, yeah, with evil switchblades, which was never really a problem. Um but we were stuck with the Federal Switchblade Act and with restrictions on switchblades in 23 states of one sort or another. You know, and we're up to 44 states with that you can possess a switchblade, an automatic knife uh, to one degree or another. Um, 32 or 33 states where you can carry it. Uh, 22 states where you can carry 23 states now where you can carry it concealed. You know, so we're making big progress. Um, it's not getting easier. I mean, the low hanging fruit has already been picked. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll see. Last year was difficult. Last year was difficult. We got West Virginia knife law preemption done. Uh, we got Ohio done, even though it was signed this year. It was passed last year. Um, but COVID shut down the legislatures. Uh, pretty much. Um, this year, we've got, you know, a bunch of bills already in the hopper. We've got South Carolina knife law preemption. We've got Texas location restricted knife law reform, trying to finish off Texas and make Texas as good as people think Texas is. Yes. Uh, uh, we've got a bill strengthening knife law preemption in New Hampshire, which was the third state we, pair, we, we passed uh, knife law preemption in, and the first switchblade ban repeal in the nation. Uh, we're trying again in Washington state to repeal their spring blade ban, spring blade. What's it's, that uh, all about? That, that, that's what they call a switchblade. Um, does, that include, have, uh, does that include a, like a Kershaw speed safe or one of no, the assisted? Um, because we fixed that back in 2012. Right. The so button. assisted, assisted yeah. openers uh, are legal since 2012. Now we're trying to get automatic knives legal. Um, they're legal to build in Washington state. They're legal to sell out of Washington state. They are now legal for, for uh, 
uh, first responders to carry in Washington State. We did all that back in 2012, and we've been working, you know, arduously since then to get switchblade ban uh, reform done. That repeal has passed um, the Senate uh, two years in a row uh, and just passed House committee and just couldn't get a floor vote either last year or the year before. So, you know, we're trying again this year. We, we don't give up. Uh, and that's part of the secret of our success. We just don't give up. Uh, well, I think probably many uh, knife lovers are like me. You kind of get wrapped up in your collection and you get wrapped up in carrying your knives and you forget, maybe you forget that this is actually serious business. And uh, if for whatever ever reason you run into a police officer uh, on a bad day or whatever, you're carrying that knife could end up being a real problem. Do you have any stories uh, of of real egregious overreach? I'm, I, I remember hearing about, about co uh, police officers in New York City seeing the outline of like a Swiss army knife in someone's pocket and, you know, and, and pinching them for that. Um, any stories like that? Does that stuff really happen? Yes, it does really happen. Um, in New York, it was, it was terrible. I mean, uh, New York city still has, uh, on the books, their administrative law that makes it illegal to carry a knife that is not a hundred percent concealed. And, you know, back before we got the law changed last year um, to get rid of their gravity knife a law, uh, any knife that they could wrist flick, and by wrist flick, I mean full body, couple, try 10 times, yeah. um, almost any knife could be wrist flicked open by, their, by, by the way that they did it. Um, you were going to get arrested, and that wasn't just a violation. That was a misdemeanor, and people literally went up the river on felony charges because they had some misdemeanors in a previous, you know, life. Um, that was terrible. I mean, we're talking over seventy thousand people wow. prosecuted in the course of a decade. Um, that was terrible, and that was a huge fight. I mean, our bill, our excuse me, our case was headed to the Supreme Court. Was basically a week away from conference and a decision by the Supreme Court to take take the, the case or not when Governor Cuomo uh, finally signed our bill after vetoing it the two previous years. Um, so yeah, that was that was that was quite a fight. And we saw that. And we we see other examples of people being uh, uh, prosecuted in questionable circumstances. Uh, we had some cases in Michigan where, uh, or a case in Michigan where a young man was accused of carrying a dagger uh, and it was simply a, a fixed blade. And, uh, you know, because of the way Michigan's laws are written, it's vague enough. Um, we, we want to get rid of those kind of laws. Vague laws are the worst because they allow judges to they allow prosecutors to interpret the law as they see fit. Mm. And sometimes those interpretations you look at and you go, uh, what's going on here? Because it doesn't make any sense. And that's what we're all about. If we get rid of the bans, then you only get in trouble for using a knife illegally if you use it to commit a crime, which, yeah, that, that should be a problem. What, what about the concept of, uh, you know, if there's a shooting, they'll bring in a forensics expert. What about in these kind of cases having a, um, you know, subject matter expert on knives? Because you have judges and attorneys and people who have really, you know, no idea about knives, just like you have legislators making um, laws about or trying to make laws about guns when they really don't know what they're talking about. It's kind of that same hysteria. What about having expert witnesses for knives? We have them, and I have been one, and we have used them uh, in cases. Um, but the, the real, the issue is the vast majority of people can't afford to defend themselves. Of course, yeah. Um, it costs a tremendous amount of money uh, to defend yourself. And, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, you get a public defender, which that individual may or may not 
uh, be able to help you. You're one of many, many cases. These are good people by and large, but they are way overworked. Uh, they have a lot of incentive to plea down these cases. Um, it takes, you know, our, our case in California where they were, were now Vice President Camilla Harris, then the, uh, the Attorney General, was prosecuting this person for carrying a concealed dagger because he had a Swiss knife, Swiss army knife open in his pocket. Now, why he had a Swiss army knife open in his pocket is that's ir crazy, but irrelevant mm -hmm. because, you know, it doesn't meet their definition of a locking blade. And that went to the California Supreme Court um, with a public defender who was willing to work his butt off for this person who was being illegitimately, unreasonably persecuted. Um, and it wasn't like there was some other crime being committed. Um, this was the only charge. And that went to the California Supreme Court, which I'm proud to say we won. Uh, we provided uh, one of the attorneys who actually argued before the, the, the Supreme Court, uh, which is pretty unusual. It, it's not common for the amici to be asked to sh share the podium with the defendant's uh, attorney. Um, and the arguments that we brought forth were, you know, part of the decision. And that was a unanimous decision. I mean, that, you know, that was like, this is just going too far, folks. It's a Swiss Army night. I mean, that's great that you won, but what a waste of state resources. My Lord, what a waste. Yep. Um, and isn't you know, there, it's like they'll chase anything. Isn't there, isn't there some, someone else committing a crime a little bit more severe you could go after before you, before you pursue this one? Do you think there might be something? There might well be, but, um, that, and, and, you know, those cases don't go to the Supreme court the state Supreme Court without the attorney general knowing what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that was a decision by Harris to persecute this individual and prosecute this case after losing at the trial court, losing at the appeals court and continuing on to the, the California Supreme Court. Well, you got to get those license plates, you know, so, uh, so, how do you feel without, you know, uh, how do you feel about the the next year in knife rights? Are, are we are we going to do any? Uh, are, are things just kind of chugging along, uh, moving forward? Would you say? W will well, they continue? I th I think they will. I mean, we're 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 facing a new landscape in terms of the difficulty of lobbying in some of the state capitals. Uh, for example, in Washington, uh, everything's going to be done virtually. Well, you know, it's hard to sit down with a uh, legislator when it's all virtual. It's hard to walk the halls um, in the Capitol and in the office buildings when it's all virtual. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. You know, Texas, I think we have good chance of getting that done. Uh, Washington, you know, we've had... We've, we've almost gotten there the last few years. So hopefully, you know, part, part of it is people get used to seeing you and it's like, okay, can we get just, all right, we're tired of seeing you. Let's pass this. And, and so it, persistence is an important part of this. Showing up is an important part of this. I mean, Todd Rathner, who's our, our lobbyist, uh, spent weeks in Ohio uh, working with our people there, talking to legislators, um, working with the governor's staff in order to get things done. You can't do these things remotely. You can't just write letters and call it in. Now, that's what we're going to end up doing to a certain extent in some of these states that aren't going to allow their legislators to meet. On the other, this, other hand, who knows? You know, this, this is a very peculiar time period for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're you know, we've gotten bills filed. We've got more bills in the hopper that are, I think you'll see filed over the next few weeks and months. And we're just going to keep plugging away because that's what we do. So how has, you know, we mentioned uh, briefly 
um, the uh, kind of all the shutdowns. How has the lack of knife shows this past year affected uh, your work? I know you go to a lot of these knife shows, if not all of them, all the major ones, and um, I know you get a lot of support from those. How has this uh, affected you? Um, it's made it much harder. Um, you know, our Ultimate Steel Spectacular, which is our primary fundraiser every year, depends on the donations of, you know, a lot of custom knife makers uh, to knife rights because those are the prizes that people want to donate to win. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's a lot easier to ask knife makers to make a donation when you're standing across the table from them or in the bar afterwards. Um, it's much more difficult. And, you know, since March of last year, we've been to two knife shows. We went to the California Custom Knife Show, uh, which worked out well despite everything. Um, and we went to the 100 Percenter Show in Texas. And we got good response, but there's a lot of makers that we still need to connect with and will hopefully continue to donate. Um, I'm yeah. making phone calls and, you know, if any knife makers are listening to this, we would love to hear from you if you'd be interested in helping us because, you know, the, the ultimate steel raises about half of our annual budget. That's a lot of money. And they would be helping by donating a piece of their work that you would then uh, have as a prize to. Uh, right. Some, right. Okay. And, and, you know, it's a drawing, it's not an auction. Uh, so, so makers don't see their their hard work oftentimes go for significantly less than what it's worth in an auction. And it's a drawing. Um, the price is on the knife is what the price is. That's all anyone sees. And it's winner's choice, as you may know. Uh, so people get to pick their prizes. First person gets their pick of everything in the drawing. Second person gets their pick of everything but what the first person picked. Uh, and on down down the line. Um, which I think helps entice people because they know they can win something that they want, not just not winning a prize, but they can win a knife they really would like. Uh, so before we wrap, I just want to find out from you, Doug, do you have any um, designs in the hopper yourself? I mean, I know you just came out with the, with the fixed bladed version, so I don't mean to be like, uh, what have you done for me lately? But uh, do you have any knife designs that you're working on? Any concepts that you're working on that you want to see fleshed out in steel? Yes. Are you keeping it uh, close to your bed? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've learned the hard way, you know, not to talk about what's going to happen before it happens. Yeah, because you can use some of that energy. That <laughs> well, uh, We'll, we'll keep working, and I think we will continue to uh, pleasantly surprise folks over the next uh, couple of years in that Great. regard. All right. So possibly the most important question of the whole show, what should people do if they find themselves running afoul of the law, whether right or wrong, with a knife in their pocket? Uh, give give us some advice and also uh, point people in the direction of where they might be able to find some of this advice written down. So. You should go to knifrights.org um, or download the uh, uh, the app that we have. Um, it in at knifrights.org and on the app, you will find recommendations on what to do if you're ever arrested. You know, starting out as you're showing on the screen, remain silent. I can't emphasize how important that is enough. Um, all of that is in the Legal Blade app. All of that is on our website um, for people who uh, who are interested in going the next step. We've teamed with um, U.S. Law Shield, which provides uh, legal defense for self-defense use not just for knives, but for any weapon, uh, including use of your hands. I mean, if it's a self, a, 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 a righteous self-defense, uh, you will be defended by them. Um, uh, and we have a article, uh, by Evan Knappen, uh, one of the, the, the leading knife law, uh, lawyers in the country, 
on the aftermath of self-defense. You know, if you find yourself in a self-defense situation and you use the knife or any other weapon, here's what you need to know. It goes well beyond remaining silent uh, to protect your rights. Um, so that when the attorney shows up, whether it's because you've got um, U.S. Law Shield protection or you've hired an attorney because you've been arrested for something, um, if you have not remained silent and if you have not followed the other recommendations that are in Evans' articles on, on knife rights or in the Legal Blade app, um, you are handicapping your attorney you are making his job much more difficult and you are you are potentially uh causing yourself lifelong troubles it's important remain silent you know ask to see your attorney do not consent to a search i mean those are the very very basics um you may not be able to stop yourself from being arrested but you can beat that rap if you have done nothing wrong and you keep your mouth shut. It's that simple. Keep your mouth shut. That's a, that's, that's great advice for lots of life. Um, but uh, definitely here, because uh, that's something I think about, you know, don't assume the police officer's a knife guy and that you can sweet talk them. Oh, I have a collection. I'm just a knife guy. Yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've been all through these. Uh, they're, these they're, they're on. In the articles, we have links to a wonderful presentation by a professor and a uh, and a detective uh, going through how you need to remain silent because this is what they do for a living. They are allowed to lie to you. They are allowed to mislead you. They are allowed to pretty much do anything to get you to say something that can be and will be used against you, even if it seems innocuous to you. Keep your mouth shut. All right. Well, Doug Ritter, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Great. Giving us that update. And of course, I love seeing how the RSK MK1 Mark I line is growing. And uh, the, the fixed blade is especially exciting to me. Uh, not to mention the purple G mascus, but it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, not only a knife, uh, knife legend, but also knife rights. Uh, we greatly appreciate your efforts, sir. My pleasure. Right. Always a pleasure. Take care, sir. You too. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Always interesting always sobering that last uh, that last little bit of conversation uh, to talk about uh, how this hobby um, you know if you're not careful um, could could bite you so so uh, you know in more than one way so definitely uh, go to kniferights.org check out some of those articles and actually read some of the uh, some of the information on the state bills they're they're pretty interesting and kind of shocking to take a look at what uh, how some of these laws were written way back when. Like, uh, you know, make sure you don't walk outside with your navel dirk on you because that could be a big problem. Um, so thanks again to Doug Ritter for being out there and fighting the good fight so that we can uh, can have this hobby and enjoy this uh, this luxury and these uh, these knives and also have them as tools and not be. Uh, accused of being some sort of a criminal. And as always, sack, keep your mouth shut, ask for your attorney, and don't consent to any sort of searches. Uh, again, go check out knifewrites.org and download the app. Uh, for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.